being a parent of a young child is an incredible opportunity, so thank you. Um, and we will move forward. So everyone can sit back down again. We'll get back to the agenda. Um, but for those of you who stood and have been parents or caregivers, what hard choices have you had to make? What trade-offs have you confronted when supporting your child's education and development? For my mother, it was giving up her career as a high school teacher to instead work 12-hour night shifts as an emergency room clerk so she could be home with her four young children during the day. She and my father both needed to work multiple jobs to make ends meet, and they couldn't afford childcare. So she instead gave up her career and her sleep to support her family. And as the youngest of, four, those, of those four young children, I perhaps benefited the most from her sacrifice. Unfortunately, my mother's story is not unique. The median household income in Los Angeles County, and that's household, everyone who's earning an income in the house, is about $55,000 a year. And this year, the median rent for a one-bedroom apartment in the greater LA County area is now over $2,000 a month. How do families survive? And this is not just an LA story. Um, I once lived in San Francisco. <laughs> families across California are faced with heart-wrenching daily decisions and I am constantly in awe of their strength, tenacity, and perseverance, but it shouldn't be this way. Families should not be forced to remain in poverty because they have children. Parents shouldn't have to choose between work and supporting their child's development. And yet, that's what our state leaders continue to choose. In California, we continue to wait to support our children until they enter the public school system or the child welfare system. Talk to any kindergarten teacher or social worker and they know. Children who have strong support and access to quality early care and learning show up to kindergarten ready to succeed in school and do not show up as another caseload in the child welfare system. At First Five LA, we are focusing our funding, our advocacy, and our work in partnership with others, many of you in this room, to address these challenges. And like all First Fives across California, we know that our state's success should be measured by the success of its children. And we know we have a long way to go. It's time for our leaders and all of us to urge our leaders to start taking the needs of our youngest learners seriously. It's time for us to start supporting the economic opportunity of working parents by ensuring all families have access to affordable and flexible childcare. And it's time for us to start acknowledging that those who care for our infants and toddlers are teaching them, not babysitting them. All parents in California deserve access to home-based coaching and support when they need it so they can become the best parent, the best first teacher for their child. All parents and caregivers in California deserve to know their child is in a safe and developmentally appropriate learning environment starting at birth. Let's stop wasting our money on expensive and unnecessary remediation, incarceration, and treatment. And let's start investing early in development, prevention, and promotion. Thanks. We are fortunate today to have a panel of experts who will be exploring this further, practitioners and leaders in the field who will identify the opportunities, challenges, and needs of the field, who will help us better understand how we can build, strengthen, and promote systems which support our youngest learners. So to moderate this discussion, I'm pleased to introduce someone who has been a lifelong champion for children and probably needs no introduction, from his service as a member of the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors to his leadership in the State Assembly, from his founding vision as the CEO of EdVoice to his current role as president of Children Now, one of the leading advocacy organizations for children. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Mr. Ted Lempert. Wonderful panelists, come up, the mic working. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that very generous introduction, and as the uh, Incredible panel uh, comes up here. Uh, first of all, wow, what a morning so far, huh? This is amazing. Um, but you haven't seen anything yet because we're gonna spend the next hour focusing on our youngest learners, specifically on infants and toddlers. So you are in for a treat. And I wanna frame the panel just with the uh, water cooler theme of working together. Um, because we're talking about 10 years ago, and I think back 10 years ago, and I, I swear sometimes folks advocating, talking about four-year-olds, folks advocating, talking about infinite toddlers, it was, 
It was like the Giants and Dodgers. And I, Molly Munger, <laughs> congratulations. Uh, Molly and I are, are very close, but I'm a Giants fan. She's a Dodgers fan. Congrats. Good Ooh. luck. Um, <laughs> but we were, we were divided as a field. Uh, today, thanks to the Advancement Project, thanks to First Five at the state level, thanks to 58 uh, county commissions at, at, throughout the state, First Five, to CAPA, the Resource Referral, to Child Care Law Center, to business leaders, to so many other statewide, local, uh, regional groups, we really are together. It's not perfect, but we have come so far as a field. So now that we've got our house in order, uh, we got to deal with the tough facts of how much work we still have to do, especially when it comes to our very youngest kids. Only around 14% of families have, uh, have access to subsidized child care. Four, three percent have access to home visiting programs. We have a tremendous and a really stunning amount of work left in front of us to really make sure that our youngest have the support um, that, that they need. Um, so f f fortunately, we are prioritizing that. I can just speak personally, as, as many of you know, Children Now works on prenatal through age 26. I spend part of my days focusing on how do we get kids aging out of the foster care system, health care through age 26, uh, how do we address the needs of English language learners in middle school and high school. Lots of, lots of needs throughout the age groups, but my, myself and my colleagues uh, spend an appropriate disproportionate amount of time on our very youngest birth to three because we all know in this room that if we don't start early, uh, it's, it's not going to work later on uh, in life. So uh, it's complicated, especially in these early years. There's no one size fits all. Uh, there's lots of different programs, lots of different needs, lots of different systems. So that's why I am so excited about this panel, um, because they are experts representing a range of uh, key areas throughout the state, a range of different programs, and can share their expertise. I'm just going to say one thing before I introduce them. Uh, Children Now works with all these guys, so I'm not going to ask them really hard questions, because you know, then they'll be mad, mad at me. So you have to ask the hard questions. I'll ask a couple of softballs. So think of the hard questions. There's cards going around, and, and you, we can either uh, we can do it from the floor, but do. Uh, think of, of your questions in advance. So I'll um, I introduce everybody one by one, and then we can take it from there. Marcel Chautel is the Child Care Planning Coordinator at Los Angeles County Office for the Advancement of Early Care and Education. Um, and I should note, I'm just giving you the brief bios. Please look at your books for the uh, longer bios. Uh, Tony uh, uh, Tyson is the Child Care Planning and Advisory Council Coordinator at the San Francisco Office of Early Care and Education. Uh, Matilda Saria uh, is the Early Care and Education Coordinator at the Office of Fresno County Superintendent of Schools. Uh, Christina Negrelli is the Senior Director of Programs at Zero to Three, running their California uh, office. And Sarah Soriano is the Executive Director of Young Horizons, which is, she's led for the past 15 years and also serves as a member of the Long Beach Early Childhood Education Committee. So with no further ado, we're going to go with the order I was given. Uh, so we're going to start with Michelle. Oh, thank you, too. Did I surprise you? Oh, did you mention yeah. Christina? OK, well, then I will do what I'm now being told, and that is we'll start with Christina then. We'll go down I couldn't remember if you did her introduction, so that's why I was <laughs> OK, go ahead. So before we get started, we had a conversation earlier, and we decided that you would answer all of the hard questions. <laughs> OK, bye, everybody. <laughs> Just so we're clear. <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, it's really exciting to be up here um, sharing the platform with my esteemed colleagues and talking about something that I'm so committed and passionate about, and, um, and that's infants and toddlers. So I was asked to describe a vision of infant toddler policy across the state of California, provide an overview of our national policy work for infants and toddlers, and share a summary of Zero to Three's Think Baby campaign and all in four minutes. So hold on, here we go. <laughs> Uh, babies are small, but their needs are big. No one sector or profession can really support uh, the needs of expectant parents, infants, toddlers, and their families. We really need to work towards strengthening our cross-sector collaborations and coordination of services, and develop policies that promote uh, good health, strong families, and positive early learning experiences. We've heard a lot about um, brain development, um, but I just want to reiterate, a child's brain undergoes an amazing period of development from birth to age three. 
producing more than a million neural connections per second. That's one million neural connections per second. It's incredible. And the development of the brain is influenced by many factors, including a child's relationships, experiences, and environment. And adults play a crucial role in supporting and building a young baby's brain. So specifically, what do infants, toddlers, and their families need? They need physical and mental health services, such as insurance coverage, prenatal care, primary and preventative care, guidance for parents to support children's healthy development, and developmental screenings to identify physical and behavioral needs. They need family strengthening services that provide for economic support to meet uh, families' basic needs. Oh, down to one minute already. <laughs> 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 wow, it goes really fast. So <laughs> quickly about our Think Babies campaign. This is how Zero to Three responds to uh, promoting policies for good health, strong families, and positive early learning experiences. We launched a campaign. Uh, last December called Think Babies in partnership with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and it's our opportunity to really um, help to uh, strengthen the message and to encourage everyone to think babies. Uh, we had a highlight of our campaign is what we call Strolling Thunder. So you may have heard of Rolling Thunder, which is a motorcycle ride in DC that brings thousands of motorcycles to the <coughs> nation's capital. And we thought babies and motorcycles, probably not. So what about strollers? Um, so we brought families from all 50 states to DC with their strollers, um, and we held it on a day in May. And the participants met with more than 150 congressional offices, including the every office, every office of a US senator. And we also held a stroll around the Capitol Hill, where families were joined by many local childcare programs and providers to march around the hill and raise awareness. So, my time is up, and if I could get <laughs> one last message in is that investments in the future must start with babies. Um, we need to provide supports to parents as they raise their young children and expand communities' capacity to support young brain development through early care and learning programs and in child welfare, and invest in the bedrock of brain connections by promoting the mental health of infants, toddlers, and their families. Great. Thank you very much, Christina. <laughs> Okay, there's been a revolt against the moderator. You next? Uh, you guys tell me. <laughs> Jeff, go ahead. Thank you, Ted. And thank you to the Advancement Project for the invitation to participate in this panel and participate on a panel with all of my friends. I know everybody up here quite well, and I get to work with them on an almost daily, if not weekly, monthly basis. Um, I loved hearing personal stories uh, yesterday and today. And I like that, you know, one of the encouragements I have is that we all think of our own personal stories as well as the personal stories of the people with whom we work and figure out a way to really lift those voices locally as well as across the state. What I'm specifically here to talk about is the data and how data can support lifting those voices at the community level as well as um, at the state to, um, to, to tell a story and to really help boost our policy asks. Um, one of the projects that, uh, that, that the California Child Care Coordinators Association has the privilege of is working with the Advancement Project on what's called the Infant Toddler Access Pilot Project. And part of this comes out of the work of the local child care planning and uh, local child Care and Development Planning Councils, the LPCs. I don't know why I forgot that all of a sudden. Um, and many of them are represented here, but um, every county local child care and development planning council through a contract with the California Department of Ed is required to do data collection analysis to determine um, where monies will go as new monies become available to support early care and education across the state. Uh, this, uh, one of the thoughts that we've had with, in partnership with the Advancement Project is how do we elevate these data um, collection efforts to our local communities to make it um, more known and useful to communities to bring the information and their stories to local policymakers as well as to bring it to the state in a much more cohesive manner. One of the things we've learned through this effort is that each county does their needs assessment, not in the same time frame, um, and maybe not using the same data set. So how do we actually coordinate our efforts to actually strengthen our, our, um, 
our, our data as a cohesive effort. Um, and so um, I think I'll, and well, and, and I think just echoing the comments that were made throughout um, our two days thus far is that we are woefully underfunded for infant toddler services, particularly for subsidized services. And we need to look at that in conjunction with quality. We can't talk about access without talking about quality, and quality is really on the backs of our workforce. Um, we all know that in this room, but how do we strengthen those messages? Again, with a collective sources of data. And then, um, and then the other thing I think is around, um, certainly around the compensation issues for the workforce, uh, we do need to, I, I'm done. We do need to, make, we do need to continue to, to strengthen that message on how do we address the compensation of our workforce. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so we set the stage, or our panel is going to... Oh, oh. So who's that, Tony? Are you next? Or is that, oh, okay. <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> I think we've set the stage already. Our panel is going a little bit rogue, but that's okay. Uh, so I was told one of my main talking points is to discuss the, the need for child care in Fresno County. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to, to share some statistics so that you understand um, the context of our, of our county. The first stat that I wanted to share is that we have over 200,000 children aged 0 to 12 years in our county. A little over 100,000, or a little less than 100,000 actually, are aged 0, um, zero to 5 years. 32% of our children are living below the poverty line. 48% of our children are living in areas of concentrated poverty. Actually, Fresno has the highest percentage of, of children living in concentrated poverty than any other county across the state, unfortunately. We have a high percentage of dual language learners and, and or English learners um, with over 100 languages spoken um, in our schools. Our top two languages are Spanish and Hmong, which is a Southeast Asian language. We have a high transiency rate in our county. We have the largest number of migrant children than any other county across the state. In regards to child care, only 23% of our children aged 0 to 5 that have need have access to child care, unfortunately. And among our youngest, our children aged 0 to 2, this is even more stark. The statistic is even more stark. Less than 10%, um, unfortunately, have access to child care that have need. According to our local resource and referral agency, Children's Services Network, we have over 4,000, close to 5,000, actually, um, I believe, since of last week, children that are on the waiting list for child care that have need uh, for child care. So these are just you know, some of the unfortunate um, statistics of our county. Uh, what's even more disturbing is that although we have such great need, we're giving back bunnies that have been allocated to our, to our county uh, for child care, for subsidized child care programs. Over the past five years, we've given back millions. Um, this past year alone, we've given back close to $10 million. This is equivalent to 1,300 kids that could have been served within our county. Um, so as it's, it's unfortunate, it's, um, it's immoral, and I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there and, and kick it over to Tony. Great. All yours, Tony. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so there's some slides here. It looks like I'm going to go really fast. Uh, former Mayor Gavin Newsom gave a lot of the background and history of how ECE is funded in San Francisco and the support that we have. Uh, but we also, uh, throughout the conference, we've heard about uh, our systems being so broken and uh, the patchwork necessary to try to keep the system uh, going as, as providing access as well as uh, supporting the workforce and having quality programs. So uh, we went through a process recently uh, within the last year where we created an early learning scholarship model uh, which took all of our local funding sources and put them into one bucket. Um, and you can see the different buckets on the top there. I'm going to keep going fast. Uh, but the, the piece uh, that's important is understanding what the cost is. What is the cost to provide quality? And so we did a, a study. Uh, we had outside um, professionals come in and do a uh, comprehensive fiscal analysis to determine what does it truly cost to provide quality care in the different settings. And these are the rates that were developed, looking at all aspects to get um, programs to a tier three QRS quality level. And this is what it looks like uh, for the providers and for the parents. 
is that um, you can see the different stacks of funds there. So your standard reimbursement rate uh, falls short by 4,000. Your, uh, your kind of your APP or your regional market rate falls short by 3,500 plus. So what we did was created this uh, level where all providers, regardless of setting, um, will receive the 20,935. This also provides uh, access availability for parents that may have been getting squeezed out of different programs because of their lack of ability to pay what the costs were. Sorry, this has lots of clicks to get through the next slide. Um, and, and what we've seen is that the quality and the investments that we've uh, put in, which is over a, around 111 million, just north of that, in our EC system, uh, 82 million of that being towards the ELS scholarships or the subsidies that are provided, um, that we're seeing a, a, an uptick in our, in our quality. And, and our QRS ratings are, um, I, I would say, really, uh, really well, uh, looking at 73% at tier four and five, and this is uh, centers and family child care providers and uh, only 1% right now at, a, at approaching quality standards. So to be part of the Early Learning Scholarship, part of that piece is that you have to have a quality program. So if you're not at a tier three or working towards a tier three, if you're a family child care provider uh, that hasn't maybe had the, uh, necessarily the resources uh, or the investment that the center-based programs had, uh, that you had to commit to becoming a tier three provider uh, within the next three years to, to be eligible for, for this funding. So. Um, with that, I will close in saying uh, we've heard lots of uh, scary statistics, but from a federal level, we're 30th out of 34 countries in children three and four accessing preschool, and we're 30th of 31 developed countries uh, in what we spend on, on our children. Um, and as we know, we've heard lots of uh, gap analysis on California. We know we have lots of work to do. Uh, I, I think that now is the time I think we're ready to do that, and I hope that we look at a zero to five approach for all children in uh, California. And last but not least. Last yeah. but not least. Good morning, everyone. I want to say thank you to the Advancement Project for having me. I get to be the voice on the ground of the one that's working with that 16,000 per, um, per child. Um, Young Horizons is a nonprofit in Long Beach. We operate five centers and serve over 400 children. We have two infant and toddler centers. Um, and as you know, that is a very low number. So I was asked to talk about the cost, what it is for us as a provider in the, on the ground doing the actual work and how difficult it is. And I think I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir because everything that has been said today already expresses what I was going to share is how difficult it is to cover costs. I did a really simple math analysis and sadly I used a $13 per hour number, which is very real. If we had an average out our um, expenses of our staffing costs, it comes out to about $13 per hour plus about 25% for benefits, it comes out to $16 an hour, $16.25 an hour. Um, so our reimbursement for three children would equal about $189. Um, the cost for those children is uh, $163, so that leaves me $26 to operate the rest of my program with. And I apologize, I have a lot of allergies and it's hitting my throat now. Um, so my voice might come and go. Um, it's not that I'm sad, although I'm very sad about this. <laughs> it's not for drama. Um, but with $26, then I, I pay for rent, facilities, food, um, everything that, that it costs to operate a center. Um, on average, every year, we lose about $20,000 or more on our infant and toddler program. As you can imagine, you do not stay solvent very long that way. It is very, very difficult. To, we only operate off of a state-funded contract. We don't have additional funding, so we do write grants, we have fundraisers, we do all of the extra stuff to, to fill that gap, but the funding just is not sufficient. Um, one of the huge struggles that we've continued to find in our field, and I think, again, I'm preaching to the choir, is that we don't have the qualified staff. People aren't running in droves to early childhood education to say, I want to change diapers all day, right? The ones that do come in our doors want to talk to children, want to teach. 
So there's a little bit of a learning gap in that as well, in that our teachers need to understand that even though they're infants and toddlers, they're learning, they're acquiring the, the, the first three most important years, as Christina was I'm talking about the most important years, as we've heard all day, is those first three years, zero to three, that brain development, laying that foundation, um, but we don't have the qualified staff, and I'm sorry, but I do not attract people at $13 an hour, I really don't. Um, and the ones that leave us to go work at Target, that go work at Costco, it's heartbreaking. And it is time that we as a field do unite and make some kind of a change of a difference. How are we going to make life fair for our children, for our parents, for our teaching staff? Thank you. So, thank you, Sarah. Um, so please do fill out cards because we're just going to weave in your questions um, into the conversation. So put your hand up if you have a, a card and I can read some of the questions. Um, so you guys are all great and, and several of you already touched on this, but maybe a, a couple, could you, or all of you if you want, respond to the, the, the challenges uh, in the in infant toddler field. I mean, I think Sarah, you just touched on some, but if you could each sort of highlight what you view as the, the biggest uh, challenges. And then uh, why don't we just take a minute too and let's make it positive as well, but like the biggest challenge and what opportunities you see in, in addressing that. So whichever order you guys want. Yeah. So um, I, I shared with all of you the, the challenge in Fresno, which is, which is access to care. Um, a opportunity, it's actually, our bill right now is on the governor's desk waiting to be signed. Um, after learning that Fresno County was giving back millions of dollars to the state, we approached our assembly member, assembly member Arambula, and he actually authored a bill, AB 258, which is patterned after um, similar pilots, child care subsidy pilots of our uh, Bay Area partners. Um, and this bill has, has four main components, um, all of which is to, um, all designed to uh, modify the eligibility rules so that more of our children will be eligible for, for um, child care subsidy programs. So one component is to allow the enrollment of children at 2.9 years. Um, with the advent of TK, our California State Preschool providers um, were not um, uh, able to enroll children at 2.9 years, and so if the bill is approved, we'll be able to do that. Um, the second component is the increase in stand standard reimbursement rate. As um, the others kind of contested to, the uh, amount of reimbursement is not equivalent to the cost of care, more or less the cost of uh, quality child care. And so this is something that, if approved, we'll be investigating and, and increasing. The other is the increase of the recertification period for our families. As I mentioned, we have a high transiency rate. It's a burden for our families. It's also a burden for our providers. Um, those, uh, those providers that can afford it actually do home visits to recertify families, which is quite, um, which is quite costly. The final component is to inc increase the income threshold for our families. Um, it's, it's unfortunate um, when uh, we have to turn families away that uh, can afford private pay preschool, but at this, or, or child care rather, um, while at the same time aren't uh, qualified to, uh, for, the, for the subsidized child care program. So this is definitely, even though we have great need for child care in Fresno County, this is definitely an opportunity. And as I mentioned, it's on the governor's desk awaiting to be signed. Um, I just received a text from our um, legislative aide that works with Assemblymember Anambula. It hasn't been signed yet, um, but we have all of our fingers and, and toes crossed that it will be. So this is a great opportunity for Fresno County. Go ahead, Christina. Uh, I, I actually, I, uh, <laughs> Matilda touched on the standard reimbursement rate, and Sarah did as well in her comments earlier, and I certainly think that's one of our challenges is how do we address the standard reimbursement rate and regional market rate? And I think there's a lot of conversations that are happening around the table around what are the priorities for this coming year. And um, certainly among that is addressing the reimbursement rates and maybe trying to figure out can we come up with some sort of single regional 
um, effort around reimbursement rates. Another challenge that we actually found in our needs assessment in LA County is a trend towards a reduction of family child care spaces in family child care homes. And we need to know more about that and why that's happening. Family child care homes typically um, pick up the gap in infant toddler services, which we don't really have covered in center-based programs, as does the license exempt. And, um, and this is not just a trend in LA County. Somebody mentioned it's a trend across the state. And I believe that we found, and Katie, Phil, and Kenyon did some research, found that it's a trend across the nation as well. Um, in terms of opportunities, uh, again, I would echo comments that other people have made that we all, are, we all are marching in the same direction. And, we, and I think the power of all of us, both locally as well as across the state, will provide us hopefully with some um, greater returns on our asks as we move forward in the future. So that's my thinking. Our um, executive director, Matthew Malmed, um, says, and he, he says it quite loudly and proudly, that this is uh, meant to be the decade for the baby. So um, I like to echo uh, his sentiments and, and ensure that we continue to move forward. I've been mean, thinking about supporting the workforce and how we respond um, as an organization. And uh, we, we support the existing infant toddler workforce through a competency-based professional development um, supports. Uh, with this workforce, we continue to ask more of them um, and not often provide the resources and supports they need to accomplish those um, additional add-ons. So I think it's really important that we, as we continue to think and respond to Sarah's comments about um, how challenging it is to recruit and retain um, those individuals who want to work and support infants and toddlers that we really think about that important role that they play and consider what other um, ways that we can continue to support them. And I was going to add, well, one of the, one, as, as we know, one of the huge challenges is the reimbursement. We were so happy to get our, our increase, our, our little bump in our reimbursement rate, um, which again does not cover, um, but um, I, I think it's, it, it, it is something to mention as a little bit of a win and also the 12 month eligibility because the hoops that our parents were having to jump through, mm -hmm. the hoops that parents were having to jump through, the hoops that my staff yeah. were having to jump through to recertify families continuously because you know they had to certify their eligibility as they had part, more part-time jobs. Um, so that, I believe, is going to provide that continuity for those families. We know, in, especially in the first three years of life, how critical it is for them to have that continuity of care. So that, I think, is, is going to be a huge win. Um, but our challenges do continue to be the staffing. I think that is something that we have to, as a field, we have to address. Tony, do you want to? Um, I, I think the one thing that I would add is that even uh, even with a well-funded uh, local system in San Francisco, we still have a huge gap in, uh, in serving all the children. 67% uh, of our children on our central eligibility list are infants and toddlers. Uh, there is not enough spaces available, in, in especially in center-based, and we do have to rely on our family child care homes um, to try to, uh, and, and our license exempt providers to try to pick up that slack and, and try to take the, get those children off the wait list. Uh, I think future investments need to include uh, it, looking at facilities. I think it's been mentioned a few times, mm -hmm, but I, mm -hmm. I know there's some, a lot of facility advocates out there, mm -hmm. like let's, let's get some more places uh, for these children to attend and then um, and compensate the workforce to, to do that. Great. Okay, well, so actually, uh, Tony, that you, you teed up the first question on the card here. Michelle, you made reference to this too, so, but whoever wants to answer. The, uh, the question states, family child care has been ignored for too long. Child care centers have been given the toddler option and family child care is not. How do we extend toddler option to family child care? Who wants to address that? Well, I'll, I can just echo what I said to start to, in my, in my brief, brief presentation was that if we have a, a reimbursement rate that is standard across, mm -hmm. then it allows for families to choose those family child care options that they may want to do that uh, that they didn't have an option before, or uh, perhaps the family child care provider um, with, a, with the re regional market rate um, 
voucher was was unable to take them uh, to stay in business. So I think that that's one local uh, one strategy to, to do that is um, to pay fairer rates to our family child care providers. Um, Heather, I'll just. Share. I want to um, lift up the phrase that Sarah mentioned um, in her panel presentation, cooperative play. I think those of us in the field need to cooperate. We need to practice, effectively practice cooperative play amongst each other because I know in Fresno County, and this is the trend across the state, our families have diverse needs. We need a mixed delivery model. We need centers. We need family child care homes. We need family friendly, excuse me, fr family friend neighbor care. Um, we need all of these types of uh, child care environments to support our diverse family needs. And so I think that um, what we need to do is lift up what, what Sarah shared during her presentation, which is practice the art of, of effective cooperative play. I was going to add, you know, and this is something we talked about in LA County, is we really need to have conversations with family child care providers. We need to talk with them about what are the issues that they are facing, what, is, what are the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of serving the children that are coming into their homes. Um, and some of that may have to do with the day-to-day -day services. Some of it may have to do with business practices. And certainly a big part of that is the reimbursement rate. But I don't know that we've actually had intense, deep conversations with them about what their needs are. And we also know that when there was a transition from the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge to the California State Preschool Program Quality Block Grant, that family child care providers were left out. I believe they were left out significantly. And so if we're talking about a system of services, that we need to think truly about a system of services that looks at center-based programs as well as family child care providers. And at some point in time, talk about our license exempt providers, many of them who are interested in becoming licensed family child care homes, or maybe not, but they are serving some of our neediest, lowest income families. And those are probably the families who need the quality efforts the most. They're the ones, you know, and I think it's something that Whit Hayslip had said um, actually at an event that we held to launch our needs assessment is that we're, it's more than school readiness when we talk about children and families. It's how are we contributing to the overall well being of the children and families in our communities as well as our community? So, taking this much broader perspective, of where does early care and education as a system, as a system, contribute to the overall well-being of children, youth, and their families. So that's yeah. This is truly, truly exciting, and I think it's so important to um, really consider all of those who care for uh, young children, infants and toddlers and young children. Um, we recently um, held some focus groups to learn from grandparents who are providing uh, care to their grandchildren to learn from them, and they need to be included, and we really need to think about all of the environments and ensure that they're promoting those uh, positive early learning experiences and connecting those alternative care providers to all of these other exciting opportunities that those programs would have access to. So we can be inclusive of all, all children and all families. I'll just add just one more thing to Thanks. echo off of what Michelle was sharing. I think a great space to have those conversations amongst um, all of our different partners are at the LPCs, the Child Care Development Local Planning Councils, which Michelle mm -hmm. shared earlier in her presentation. There's one in every county across the state, and that's a forum where we could have those conversations about what are the needs of the community, how could we support each other as child care providers in the field. All right, the next, um, actually the next and only question, so if there's another question you can stand up from the <laughs> audience or bring up another card, but it seems so obvious that an opportunity to stay home with new baby will help the infant toddler shortage. What's happening with paid family leave for new parents? What's the cost comparison? So l I'll, I'll answer that first by uh, let's make sure the governor signs Senator uh, Jackson's bill, thanks to the support of everybody here in this room, so let's. Uh, <laughs> Let's all say that really loud and surround his office this afternoon. But uh, quite frankly, that's, that's really just a, 
a, a first step given the comparisons we heard this morning about what other countries do. So your, your thoughts on FAVE family leave and, and how it interacts with the programs and systems you're all involved with. Wow. You don't all have to answer, but at least one of you do. <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that. Um, I, I, my nephew's girlfriend is from Sweden, and <laughs> I bring that up. Um, ha and, the, and then I had a young man from Sweden staying with me for a bit of time, and they were both incredibly shocked at our lack of support for families with infants and toddlers, and um, the supports that other countries have for families to allow them to stay home at, when their children are very young. I, I don't, other than that, I don't know what to say about it other than I just think it's shameful that we do not have the supports in place to allow families, and in particularly families of low income, to be able to stay home with paid leave while their children are very young for maybe three months, is that enough? Six months? A year? So I don't, that's all I have to say about it. I, I would just add, um, my, the first thought as a provider comes to mind, oh God, I need a substitute. <laughs> 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 but, um, but how wonderful would that be, honestly, yeah. if, if we implemented some kind of policy, um, and, and this is what this room is about, isn't it? Is it a, is it a wake up call to us that we need to start advocating for families to have that bonding time because we're right. We, we say it to our parents all the time. You are your, first, your child's first teacher. So let's practice what we preach. And if we're telling our parents that, then let's give them that time and honor them in that way. And I think the studies that we see of the wonderful achievements from other countries could be attributed to that. Has any study been done? Advancement project? Has any studies been done that, that um, show a correlation between that first strong bond with the parent that then leads to success in school. I'd be very interested to, to see something about that um, and would wholeheartedly support a year of leave. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Delane Easton said it quite well yesterday and um, that the other countries are using our research. It's, <laughs> it's sad um, that we, we know what we need to do, and we just haven't done it. So I think that that's the step, is, is literally standing behind the research that we developed and, and putting the money behind it to make sure that we can, we can, we can do this. Great. Yeah. All right, in the spirit of the hard questions come on the cards, oh. uh, what should a single reimbursement rate system look like? <laughs> okay, next question. No. <laughs> You said you would take the hard No, ones. no, that's not what's happening. <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be Tony. <laughs> is, that, is that me? Um, well, I, I feel like the, the one thing that we did look at, it, there is a slight difference between the FCC rate and, and, the, and the rate for uh, center-based uh, providers. But there's so many factors that were included in, in estimating those costs. So I think it's gonna be very challenging. It, it's not a one size fits all for each community. Uh, mm -hmm. The cost to provide care in each, in each uh, I would say each zip code, each neighborhood uh, can vary. So I, th I think that's one of the things is that if we have, we have a tool that you can plug in your numbers and say, hey, uh, you know, this, this costs per square footage and this is what a, a teacher mm -hmm. with the site supervisor permit should have and this is what it costs for all the materials you need so that you, your accuracy score is high. I mean, all of those little factors are included in, into the number that we came up with for San Francisco. So I think if, if that's something that could be replicated and shared with other communities to, to do that, I think that might be a first step. But um, other than that, I, I, it's, not, it's not a one size fits all just because it's such a different uh, environment everywhere you go across the state. And I think that we know that as local planning councils, we see that as we talk to each other of what's going on in our, in our, local, in our local communities. Great, anybody else on that one? Okay, um, we, I think we might just have time for this last question, but hopefully you'll each get a chance to, uh, to comment. Um, we have heard that we must prioritize infants and toddlers. What should we be doing to assure that our elected officials invest in a affordable infant and toddler spaces. So we can, uh, whoever wants to start, but maybe each of you can get a chance to just make a quick closing comment as well. I think we can use 
um, opportunities such as the, the Think Babies campaigns and the other campaigns to help elevate the needs, the, the variety of needs that infants, toddlers, and their families have, which go well beyond childcare. And I think we need to continue to reiterate those important messages, and, um, and it, it, we can't stop now. And I think um, continuing to strengthen our unified voices um, and to go collectively. We've done a really great job at articulating the early years, but I think now it's time to really work on elevating the specific needs of infants, toddlers, and their families, and to use that similar pro excuse me, process of, of what we just accomplished and uh, bringing everyone together to collaborate and to create that unified voice. Okay. Michelle? Um, it was really wonderful hearing, I think, most of the gubernatorial candidates mention the brain science mm -hmm. um, and mention the importance of the early years. Mm -hmm. I think we need to keep bringing those messages to them and pairing it with the data on the numbers of children who have or don't have access to infant toddler services and what those services look like. What does the quality of infant toddler services look like? Again, when we talk about access, are we just talking about numbers, putting children in seats or cribs or bassinets? Are we talking about putting, providing children, very young children, infants and toddlers with high quality experiences, whether they're in a center-based program, a family childcare home, or even with a license exempt provider, not to minimize, that's an important place for children to be. And parents make choices about where their children are going to be. I think the other piece, pieces, how do we engage, and I know there's going to be a panel on this later on, but how are we engaging the families, how are we engaging the people in our communities to bring their messages to the table as to what do they need for their families when they have infants and toddlers that they're trying, for which they're trying to find services. Those are some initial thoughts. Um, again, I think as we continue to have conversations around a lot of our tables and as unified voices, that we can think about what those messages are as well. I know there's some work already happening in terms of how to bring um, messages to the state level with respect to elevating the needs of our infants and toddlers. Not to ignore that we still need spaces for preschool children, but we really need to have some intense um, intentional focus on our infants and toddlers at this point in time. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we could just do 30 seconds each for okay. each the last three of you so we can wrap up in time. That's quick. Um, I, I would have to say, you know, we, we need to look at what the costs are to provide it. I think that's one of the biggest barriers that, that's causing folks to not be able to serve infants and toddlers. And though we've had some, uh, some gains and some, some wins over the last year and mostly in the preschool arena as far as mm -hmm. increases to standard reimbursement rates, we haven't seen the investments in zero to three from the state level. So I think that there hasn't been the, the investments uh, that we've seen in the gains. So I think that's the first step is uh, to invest more and uh, start paying to the, to the cost to provide quality care. Thank you. I'll try to keep it short and succinct. I agree with all of my fellow panelists. <laughs> Everything that they shared, I agree with. I think one other, um, again, lifting up what Sarah mentioned earlier about effective cooperative play mm -hmm. among our systems, but then also the inclusion or cooperative play amongst our non-traditional partners like the business sector, um, workforce investment boards, all of these uh, partners have a stake in what we do in the childcare field. And so, again, echoing my, my fellow panelists and then um, the, the uh, lifting up the effective cooperative play. And I want to borrow from our friends in the investment world. Um, I think JP Morgan has a tagline that says, we think in terms of decades, <laughs> not in terms of months or years. We need to think in terms mm -hmm. of decades as well. We're about breaking the cycle of poverty. And when you empower individuals to break the cycle of poverty, the social good is exponential. Lives are changed communities are elevated, and economies are stabilized. Great. Let's give a round of applause to these extraordinary leaders. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Much to the panel. And thank you, Ted, for facilitating. They went rogue, but you hung right in there. Good job. Good job. So uh, it's my pleasure now uh, to introduce, so I know Peter Barth had you all stand up, that was great, but just take another big deep breath. 
This is all great information and all of your comments will help with our one voice in this next session and in what we do going forward. So hang in there for one more panel, which is gonna be a great one. It's my pleasure to introduce Ernesto Saldana, who is the Associate Director of Educational Equity, focused on education programs at the Advancement Project California. He oversees the organization's first effort in leadership and advocacy in community, community mobilization and advocacy for parents with children from birth to age eight and supporting the team's education policy and advocacy. He is a busy dad of a toddler and he is an all around good guy who works hard on behalf of young children and families. It's my pleasure to bring him up here to really talk about the community voice in policy initiatives. Ernesto, give him a big hand. Thank you. It's bright up here. Ooh. How's everybody doing? Excellent. So thank you, Camille. Hello, everybody. You saw me running around all over the place. Who's that guy running around all over the place for, right? So um, it's my honor to be able to um, facilitate our conversation with our distinguished guest. Um, I'll be introducing him in a little bit. But he's just an amazing gentleman who I've met through some work in Southeast Los Angeles. And he's from my hometown, my birth town of Santana, Santa Ana in Orange County. So he's doing an incredible transformative work. And um, so we'll be talking about community voice during this next 25 to 24 minutes. And a community voice, community engagement. In the context for this conversation, I just want to set the context that um, for this conversation, obviously with community, we can mean different, different, different groups, right? For this tone of this conversation, we'll be talking about families and parents, just to set the context, okay? Um, so part of the thing that's really critical for me as I engage in this work is thinking about values, right? Values that anchor me as a Latino, as a Chicano, um, working with communities of color, oftentimes low-income communities of color, to have a voice, to have space. Um, how pivotal that is, especially during these, these times that we're in currently, right? So I had the privilege of coming to, to Advancement Project California um, about two and a half years ago to support a program called My First Teacher with my colleague, Yesenia Reyes, who you've also seen running around, who's an amazing colleague back over there, um, where we worked with the parents in Southeast Los Angeles um, to support them to continue building their leadership skills to be the advocates for their children's early child education. Um, so that was the work we did. So um, I'm gonna share a little bit about some research findings that we had from the program. We, we had a, um, a professor by the name of Dr. Karina Benavides Lopez who did a research paper. She also happens to be my partner. Um, she did a research paper on the program where she brought focus groups together of parents who participated in the program to find out what are some of the things we learned? What did we miss up on? What did we get right, right? Um, so she brought them together, and I'll be sharing a little bit about that, and then I'll be handing it over to Rico so he can talk about just the incredible work he's doing in Santana. Um, get your pens out for him, because he has some incredible strategies. Uh, we were talking last night, just having the conversation of the different strategies, the innovation that he's gonna be sharing, sharing with you, please have your notepads and pens ready. Um, we're, I'm a little bummed, because we won't have time for Q&A, because I think there would be a great spark conversation around it. So to preface, just to go back, to preface to this, this research brief that you will find on the table, it's on the paper, it's on the table. It's, it's not a very fancy document. It's a, a six page document, quick read, that summarizes the My First Teacher program. And some of the key findings that uh, Professora Corina Benavides Lopez found was, you know, first let me preface this, I'm sorry. Let me preface this. As we're talking about community engagement in the work that we do, the importance is that we see that low-income communities of color oftentimes carry the hardest, the, the, the biggest burden of misaligned, misinformed policy, right? Um, they're faced with policy struggles all the time. They hit the walls all the time because of the limitations of what we put together as policy. And in addition to that, they're not, they're not really included ever in the policy creation process. Maybe give, give, us, give us your input at, that input at that hearing, right? Let's have your hearing input but not in the sense of a, a, a conversation to really understand policy and how it may be missing um, for communities. And in addition, communities of low-income um, communities and communities of color often 
seen in a deficit light, always seen what's wrong, what's missing, what are they doing wrong all the time, right? And so oftentimes in, in need of some kind of saving, which um, is tough, right? So um, our goal with the My First Teacher program was to shift that paradigm, to shift the paradigm from being from, from this deficit lens to this asset lens, to look at community for the power they have and they bring in the space. That community is, is buttressing against policy limitations all the time. They are experts on policy and efficiency all the time. So to tap into that expertise, to channel it would be such a critical opportunity. And what we wanted to do with the My First Teacher program is we said, just any night, said, let's, let's, let's shift it. We're not gonna come to the parents and tell them what they don't know, what they, what they should know better about. We're gonna shift the paradigm. And parents were the center of the pedagogy. They weren't the ancillary. They were the center of the pedagogy in the program. So some of the findings we had in the research brief that you could pick up in the back resource table is strength-based program curriculum where, ped where parents are the center of the pedagogy and their lived experiences with a critical piece of knowledge really promoted this, this uh, connection to education policy and advocacy for parents. That using a popular education model was critical because pa parents, we saw them entering the space not like, oh, what am I going to, ay, pobrecito padre, como te voy a ayudar? Poor parent, what am I, how am I going to help you? No, that they come in capable. So that was really critical in the work that we did. Storytelling, as you all know, is beautiful and it's incredible and it's transformative. So we knew we needed to bring in the power of storytelling. And that's what we did. And we saw storytelling being multiple um, key pieces. One key piece was a way to resist oppression. And finally, we use the L word in our program work, love. Love, love, love. Was critical in the heart of this program because what we got to do is we got people to be vulnerable because we were vulnerable, because we were in the space with them. And that accelerated and deepened their connection to advocacy. So last night, I had a quick minute to just jot down some thoughts and they're just kind of words, but I just wanna read them to you because I think they kind of um, evoke this work around community engagement. Community engagement, community voice. What does it need to grow? ¿Qué necesita para crecer? Community voice is like a person. It's like any authentic relationship. It needs space. It needs presence. Se necesita comunicación. It needs to be understood. It needs to be seen. It needs to be fed by true partnership. It needs love. Se necesita amor. Advocacy is one of the truest acts of love that I know. We advocate for those we love and care for. People often foolishly mistaken love as a needy thing or a thing of weakness. Um, but I think love is the contrary. It's bold, it's fierce, it's the ultimate act of vulnerability. To give in the face of uncertainty. To fight in the face of uncertainty. Love is a working class immigrant mom who's willing to step out her front door despite being under the real traumatic threat of deportation a deportation that would end her life as she knows it, but she still walks into that uncertainty through that front door to take her child to a preschool program. Love is brave in the face of adversity. Love is community. So with that, I want to introduce a, a warrior of, I, I would say, love. Um, Rigo, we share an incredible tie to a city that has taught, I'm sure, both of us how to love and, and give love. Um, Dr. Rigo Rodriguez um, is the governing board member for Santa Ana Unified School District who so was needed on that school board to do some amazing work. He's driven by a deep passion and love for improving early learning outcomes in the seventh largest school district in the state of California, Santa Ana Unified. He's an associate professor of Latina, Latino public policy in the Department of Chicana, Chicano and Latina, Latino studies at Cal State University Long Beach and a nationally recognized speaker, uh, expert in community planning action research, and, and grassroots leadership development. So break out those notepads and pens. 
Here you go, take it away, sir. Wow. Thank you. Um, is the microphone working? Yeah. Yes, okay. And how does this work? This you just click slides? it? Where do I click on the green button? Let's see. There you go. Okay. Right on. So first I want to thank um, Ernesto and the Investment, Investment Project for inviting me uh, here today. I uh, specifically want to thank uh, Ernesto for the kind words and also the, the language of love that he started this panel with. Uh, it really does touch me and it resonates with the stories that I hear in our community. Um, and I think programs like My First Teacher uh, work, and I think we all know that, right? We all know that these programs work. And so when I was invited to uh, share my reflections on uh, engaging community voices for policy and systems change to achieve and improve early learning outcomes, um, of course I thought that um, my first thought was, let's talk about parents and engaging parents, right? And the question that came to mind was this one, right? How do we support parents with young children to advocate for systems and policy changes, right? And then the, the um, as I started reflecting on my experience in Santa Ana, a different question came to mind, which was, how do we, as organizational leaders, embrace uh, systems and policy changes, right? A different question, because we know folks will mobilize. People are brave. If they can stand up to immigration, right, and take their kids to the school, we know that there's a deep set of values. I'm the youngest of 13. My parents. Uh, we're braceros, my mom stayed at, uh, in Mexico two years at a time. We know we can make this happen, but the real question is, uh, do we as organizational leaders, can we embrace systems and policy change, right? How many of you here oppose parent voices and parent input? Raise your, raise your hand, right? It's not that we oppose parent input. I think what we resist are the systems and policy changes that uh, follow from hearing their voices. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes, right? And so, um, uh, and again, opposition and resistance are two different things. Opposition will tell you no. What you said as parents, we can't do. That's opposition, right? Mm -hmm. Resistance is, yeah, that's a great thought. Smiling, right? <laughs> right? But in the back of my mind, ain't going to happen. I got five issues. You're number six, right? That's resistance, right? Mm -hmm. And so the hunch that I had or that we had is, you know, can we create a space where organizational leaders can come together and um, embrace policy and system change? Because the hunch that we have is that if we do, then it'll be much easier for us to not just hear and honor the voices, but do something with it, right? So what I want, does that make sense, folks? Yeah. That's our hypothesis, speaking as an academic, right? <laughs> Um, and so what I'm going to tell you the story of is the Santa Ana Early Learning Initiative and the six steps that we took to really release uh, this energy amongst policy and systems leaders around embracing policy and systems change. And the uh, SALI, as we call it, Santa Ana Early Learning Initiative, mm -hmm. uh, our purpose is to improve early learning outcomes uh, for all children prenatal to nine in Santa Ana. Santa Ana is the... Um, it's about 350,000 folks that live there. It's uh, probably the youngest city in the United States, Sec uh, fourth most densely populated city in the United States. You know, New York, uh, San Francisco, uh, Boston, and then uh, Santa Ana. Uh, most overcrowded uh, city in the country, right, in terms of the number of people per housing unit. Density is the number of people per uh, square mile. I'm an urban planner, but I'm also the youngest of 13 having to live in those homes. <laughs> Right you know, two bedrooms, an extended family of 20 in one restroom. That's when you really learn about systems and policies, <laughs> right? Like, who gets that's to right. use the restroom at one time, et cetera, right? Who gets to sleep in this bed and all that. That's right. um, and so it's a tall order. Imagine having to really improve early learning outcomes for all children. So that's what we set up for ourselves. Step one, find organizational leaders with an itch to scratch. And what that means is not just uh, those of us that want to talk about something that's really important to us, but take action, this balance between learning and action. So we needed to find people that um, really had a, a passion and a commitment that we weren't going to try to convince, right? Mm -hmm. Who were those? Three lonely organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, Delhi Center, I'm a board president for that. 
the Orange County Labor Federation, interestingly enough, they have 96 unions and many of them work in the low wage sector with young families who were, um, you know, some of their members were being dismissed because they couldn't find care for their toddler that had gotten sick and now they were being reprimanded. So childcare, that was a key issue for them. With the Soil Science and Arts Academy, they have a preschool and they were finding that more families were coming in, uh, young families with the need for, for housing, et cetera. So my kids go to that school, so it's, it was basically three of us, three organizations that said, we gotta do something about it with families with young children. So that's how it started. And we committed to meeting on a monthly basis. We were able to get uh, a grant from the Children and Families Commission for us to sit down and get some technical assistance because we knew we didn't know much, but we were committed mm -hmm. to, we had an itch to scratch, right? And so they provided us with lots of information and a lot of technical assistance. And so uh, step two that we took was we swam in the data. We asked tough but very stupid uh, questions. <laughs> and what do I mean by that? And that is that Playfully speaking, a stupid questions is when you hit the limit of your knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And then we feel so uncomfortable like mm -hmm. asking that question that we never ask it. But when you're mm -hmm. talking to three groups, so three people that trust each other, mm -hmm. it's when you hit those stupid questions, mm -hmm. again in a playful way, mm -hmm. that you begin to open up the possibility of, first of all, embracing the unknown that I can't know everything. Mm -hmm. So I need to ask these questions. So we started looking at the early development index that has five developmental domains. I can speak intelligently now about it, but at that time, like, <laughs> what does basic literacy mean, right? <laughs> and, and so they gave us all this information. Here is Santa Ana. Mm. And as you can see, all the red is that we're at the lowest percent quintile of the county. Uh, in terms of basic literacy, we looked at the Family Financial Stability Index, we mapped it out, it looked very much the same. Mm -hmm. We looked at ready and basic numeracy, same, 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 right? Mm -hmm. So we swam in the data, we had as much fun as we could stand, and we said, uh, we gotta start doing something, right? So what we mm -hmm. did was, uh, we owned it, we don't moan it, right? Mm -hmm. We know the outcomes were low, but we owned it, don't moan it. That was our, lo um, our slogan, mm -hmm. and we decided to focus on the future. What does that mean? We took those low level of whatever we were at in every one of those indicators and we turned it into a baseline. We said, okay, we own it, don't moan it, it is what it is. We're at 67% for basic literacy. The question is, where do we wanna be? And that's when we start setting up our goals. We looked at what the county average was and we said, we need to meet and exceed the county average in the next five years in this city, right? It may be completely misguided because there's only three of us, right? Mm -hmm. But we started with that, right? And then we set up our interim <coughs> measure. Benchmark, okay. How many times do I have to click? Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, it's not working. <coughs> Can I ask a stupid question? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? I think working on that. Oh, here it is, there yay! We go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So after um, uh, doing that part, it was really important because it really released our energy, right? Instead of uh, hitting ourselves over the head, uh, we started to ask ourselves, well, how can we get there, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, there's only three of us, we gotta bring in more people. So yeah. engage more people, but in other systems. The system that we were a part of is the Family Economic Stability Economic Development System. Mm -hmm. So we work with, you know, on income supports, on workforce development, business development, financial inclusion, that's our, our basket. But we know that there were other systems, so we invited the prenatal to three, mm -hmm. the ECE community, mm -hmm. uh, pre-K through fourth grade, the school system, and uh, only three groups responded. Mm -hmm. But we didn't focus on who didn't show up, we focused on who did. Sure. And it was the prenatal to three-year-old that showed up, and so we spent the time doing the same thing, SWAM and data, and, and in the end, we identified uh, a five, five year goals using five metrics, um, and we adopted the two generation model, which basically says mm -hmm. if we want to create and sustain these um, outcomes for children, we also have to work with the parents. You probably already know this, this is probably old news to you. Um, and it's not just around parenting capacity, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. Strengthening um, and building on the strengths that parents already have, yeah but also meeting their economic needs. And that's where we had a common approach uh, to addressing the issue, right? Are you tracking me so far? Mm -hmm. All right, so step five was create more opportunities for alignment. So now there were two systems starting to talk to each other. 
we had a plan, we have, uh, you know, roughly speaking, and then we have an approach. So we're feeling like, okay, now we can start going outwardly. So now it's time to create opportunities for alignment. So what happened? From January uh, 2016 all the way to December uh, uh, 2016, we had been meeting. And in November, I got elected. Total surprise. But when I got elected, I already had friends uh, from this trusted group. Uh, and then what happened uh, beginning in January is the district prioritized early learning. How? All right, this is where it's not working. But uh, a couple of things. One is that the early learning agenda yep. became the top three priority, number one of three. It included early learning, not just defined as early literacy, but also math and social emotional skills. How, do, nice. how did we include that? Because I was in this other group, right? Uh, we also embedded it in the superintendent's evaluation for that year. So you know the message started trickling down. And we also requested that within six months, the district have an early learning framework that shows their commitment and how they're gonna approach and align. And then they developed an English, uh, early learning internal task force. And then we as a board also uh, provided uh, $3 million from the LCAP mm -hmm. to be able to fund whatever mm -hmm. strategies emerge, which we haven't defined yet, but there's a pot of money for that year for $3 million to really catalyze that work, right? Quickly, this is the framework that they created. I want to point your attention to uh, the, your top left-hand corner. Do you see two-generation model up there? Mm -hmm. And right above that prenatal to eight, that's the result of this alignment work. Never before had they thought about early learning prenatal. So this is prenatal to eight, mm -hmm. two-generation approach. And as you can see, at the center is not the school system that asks, how are parents going to support us? Mm -hmm. At the center of it are the children and the families, that middle circle. Uh, basically means uh, all those things that are happening in families and communities, right? And that, um, that uh, uh, gray uh, circle uh, that embraces that, that's how the school district can support. We call this the, uh, the pizza, uh, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. I just want you to know that if you look at the red and the yellow, green on the right-hand side, that's what the school district does really well, I mean, at least tries mm -hmm. to do. Uh, TK through uh, third core instruction, numeracy, mm -hmm. and literacy, if you see that. Mm -hmm. The other three slices of the pizza, social emotional learning is new for them in terms of prenatal to eight. Early childhood education, that's a new slice of the pizza that they have now said we need mm -hmm. to align with. And then parent engagement, restructuring mm -hmm. parent engagement to begin with pre-K uh, through third grade, right? So that's an example of how uh, by bringing folks together, we've been able to create stronger alignment across these systems. Finally, step six is taking action and learn by doing. So we didn't want to stop here. Um, the hardest thing uh, with planning is we come up with a beautiful plan, and then what we do with it? We shelve it, right? We wanted to pivot towards action. So our, pivot, uh, our pivoting strategy was a scale-up strategy. We didn't have the ability to go uh, district-wide. It wasn't just a matter of resources. We didn't have a coherent structure, a process, or a model. Mm -hmm. So uh, we identified three neighborhoods. Those are the three neighborhoods that are in uh, squares. Um, we now have 50 plus organizational leaders at the table. Uh, early care and education has about 10 to 15. Family economic success, we have like 20 folks there, credit unions and others ready to do the work. And then importantly, we've got nine elementary school principals at the table, plus their you know, core folks. And all we're doing is trying to make sure that we're ready to, to implement this. We have a grant for the next 12 months to literally test out different activities, right, um, around alignment. Um, and we also have identified 200 plus parent leaders uh, in each of those schools, PTOs, wow. as, you know, school site councils, English language advisory committees, mm -hmm. clubs, et cetera, faith-based agencies, et cetera. We chose the neighborhood model because it allows us to have the prenatal to eight plus integrating services and systems. Finally, uh, just to kind of put it all together, that's the, that's the model that we use. Uh, I won't go through it all again, I'll just end with this. Whenever um, uh, systems leaders and organizational leaders are asked to take on a, a, a major task, I think you've heard this expression, it's like herding cats. You've heard that, mm -hmm. right? Presumably that's the hardest thing to do, herd cats, because each one is so independently minded and all that stuff. I think what we've learned from this is that it's not so hard to herd cats if you put out a milk bowl, <laughs> right? If you put out a milk bowl, nice. those cats will come. 
Nice. And for us, that's been the milk bowl. It's <laughs> creating an opportunity for people who have commitment, people who are interested to align, et cetera, to really come together, learn from each other, mm -hmm. trust each other. Mm -hmm. And I think in that way, we have uh, been able to prepare our systems leaders and organizational leaders, myself included, to embrace systems change. And as you can see, those 200 parents that, that we've identified, we're waiting for them to come in, right? Um, and, and get involved. So uh, that's the story that I wanted to share with you. And I'd um, uh, be happy to talk to anybody outside this uh, you know, session about the details of each one of those steps. So thank you for listening. Great. Do we have a quick minute for me to ask a quick question? A couple questions? Got it. So, Regal, thank you very much for that presentation. It just captures it so succinctly in all the different moving pieces. And I can imagine each one of those six boxes has probably some powerful stories to be heard. Um, What's, because a part of me sees the work, I know the work you do, like in Southeast Los Angeles and other parts of the state. What's important for you about capturing community, community voice um, within a policy process or advocacy process? What's the most important thing? Yeah, for you, in, yeah. In capturing community voice. Um, uh, in, I think we have to be careful not to define community only in terms of parents. Community yes. is also these other organizations Providers, that yes. are in communities. Nonprofits. Uh, and communities are, are some of those, yeah. I think the, the most important thing, of course, is not just to find out what the need is, right, and prioritize those, but, but also to figure out how we can all of us have a common goal um, and, and then be able to align our work. Mm. Um, that's the most important thing for me right now. Uh, this is the first time, uh, I didn't show you a dashboard. We now have a dashboard of 15 measures of the mm -hmm. hundreds that we looked at. We have baselines and then we have five-year goals that, en that encompass all the work that we're doing. It's the first time that we now have like a common destination mm. and we can all get in our own lanes. You know, some like to carpool, fine. Others like to caravan, fine. But we're all in our own lane, but we're heading in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And I think by uh, capturing community voice, we get to know what, what is that end point that we all want to get to, right? Because if you leave one of those community voices out that needs to be in, then where we're going is not necessarily, you know, where we need to go, right? So I think that's the most important thing for me. And, and whatever process we set mm. up, uh, should enable folks to articulate what they, where they want to be, right? Right on. One more quick question. You were talking about, I remember we were talking leading up to this conversation, uh -huh. and you said a really powerful statement. You said, you realize the district system needed to be more ready. It wasn't ready to make, fa to make families and kids ready mm -hmm. for the system. I thought it was a really powerful comment. Um, so you mentioned that Santa Unified System was working to get ready. Mm -hmm. For, for community input and just this process of, of community, community input, family input, provider, nonprofit, all these different parts, right, the economic support piece. Um, what, what, is, what are you seeing as you're kind of working to build the system to be ready? What are some of the key um, pieces that you are excited about mm -hmm. um, as you've been working through to get the system? Is it more ready? Is it, is it where is it in the sense of making well, it more the, ready to, the, to the receive most, community? Uh -huh. yeah, no, the most important thing is the willingness of system leaders to really uh -huh tackle and, and address and, and change systems and policies. That's mm -hmm. the, it's, it's that collective will, that willingness. Mm. So for example, um, when we were in asking the uh, ECE group, like what do you need mm -hmm. when we get into these neighborhoods? They said, we need an infographic that basically just helps in popular education terms. We can give to parents so parents know how to navigate. We need to engage the dads, right? Because uh, brain science says dads stimulate certain parts of the brain. I'm like, I don't understand, but I, I get it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we need to create pipelines for the um, uh, workers, right? The child care providers. So on the family economic support side, we're, we're linked to the Workforce Investment Act. And we're saying, okay, well then let's start advocating for occupational, for mm -hmm. new occupations or trainings and resources. Uh -huh. um, and, and let's, um, on the, um, uh, th then one of the principals said, hey, like three-fourths of my kids go to uh, Dr. Gonzalez down the street. I've never spoken to him, but I know that he's, he you know, treats three-fourths of our family, so let's get connected too, right? So in those neighborhoods, I think we have new ways to start collaborating, but also modifying our systems and processes. And I'll say one last thing. If go I for can. it. Go for it. In that neighborhood, the, oh, if I could show you that. In one of those neighborhoods, 
in, in Santa Ana, the largest ethnic group of Mexicans, because not all Mexicans are not the same, right? They're Michoacanos, people from Michoacan, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and if you've ever Michoacan been to Michoacan, paleterias, the, the, they have the best ice creams uh, ever. Mm -hmm. So there's an industry of paleteras, paleterias of La Michoacana, right, in, yeah. in Santana. And so over the weekend, I showed up to La Paleteria, and there's this lady with a, a toddler, and she's mm -hmm. going through the paletas. Mm -hmm. Esta es de Guanabana, esta es de Mame, esta mm -hmm. es de Chongos, right? In mm. Spanish, using language that that's, she's an expert on, so it yeah. speaks to what you were saying. And I was thinking, this person either went through my first teacher or it's natural or whatever is happening, this is what I want to see in our neighborhoods, mm. right? The language, but also la paletería, the business being the business part thing. of an early learning initiative, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, awesome. uh, to me, that's the kind of stuff that we want to see in our, connect the dots. And yeah. I don't think we have organizations or networks that are connecting the dots across these communities. So anyway, right thank, thank you for you allowing so me to talk to that. Me Help me, Adam. join me in thanking Rigo. Thank you. Dr. Rigo Rodriguez. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're good? Thank you both. Uh, so thank you again to Rigo and Ernesto for this discussion on community and how to build one. Excellent. Excellent. The other thank you I would just like to say to Rigo is thank you for, for putting yourself out there to be elected to a school board. We've had several up here. That's not an easy task, folks. Uh, I actually know that because I am one. But um, thank you so much for, for working to do that. So nice job. Okay. Well, before we uh, leave, we have several people in the audience we just want to recognize who have joined us, legislative staff members. Uh, so if you hear your name and you're in the room, please stand up so we can recognize you. Sarah Noceto from the Senate Office of Research. Amelia Zamani from Assembly Member Nazarian's Office. Adina Garcia from Assembly Member Caldiero's Office. Debbie Look, I saw her earlier, from Assembly Education Committee. And finally, Stacy Reardon, a special assistant to the speaker. Are you all here? Could you stand up again? Yay, give them a hand. Thank you for being part of our conversation. So uh, we have a little moving to do. That's a good thing. First of all, I want to thank you all for being so present and here this morning for sharing with us all this great information. But we have an exciting uh, luncheon keynote. Uh, Sonia Manzano, who is best known for her role as Maria on Sesame Street. Can I just tell you how excited I am that she's here? <laughs> that she doesn't know the hours that I've spent with her many years ago, which I have. Uh, uh, she is an incredible leader with an inspiring story that I know you will all want to hear. So, but here's how we have to do this, folks. We have to get up and we have to take our stuff and leave the room for about 15 minutes so folks can come in and set up for lunch and the hotel can get ready. So we'll close the doors, you'll be out there so you have room to check your, e or time to check your email, get on the phone, take a stretch. Um, so again, thanks so much for this morning and we'll see you back in here in about 15 minutes. Thank you.